I came across this epigram that I thought spoke volumes. The envious die not once, but as often as the envied wins applause. Every time the envied wins applause, the envious die. And here's the picture. What's she getting? So what are we talking about when we talk about envy? Like virtually all the vices, it is a disordered desire. So you go down the list. Pride, it's a desire for position. And it's a disordered one. Lust, disordered desire for pleasure. And so forth. So it's a disordered desire. The noun is a discontented longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. A discontented longing for someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. That's the noun, envy. The verb, to envy, to long for something that belongs to someone else. Someone else has got it, and I want it. Getting a little more pointed. An emotion which occurs when a person lacks another's quality, skill, achievement, or possession, and either desires it or wishes the other did not have it. This is as in so many definitions in the Western world. You start with Aristotle. Pain at the sight of another's good fortune, stirred by the feeling that they have what we ought to have. So you see, especially in these last two, this idea of They've got it, and I want it, and they shouldn't have it. So that then raises the question, how is envy different from covetousness? Covetousness is wanting what somebody else has. But the difference is especially in that latter point that we were just making. To covet is to want a similar thing to what somebody else has. Well, he has a big, fine car. I want a car like that. And most often, this is a possession of a material nature. Not always. But if you look at the commandment, his house, so forth. Jerry and I were talking last night, uh, covet his wife. And I said, it's, he has a trophy wife. I want a trophy wife too. Not necessarily his, <laughs> but one like that. Envy, on the other hand, is to want the thing itself that the other person possesses and preferably that they not possess it. 
I want what they have, and I don't want them to have it. And especially here, more commonly, we're talking about an honor or a position or an achievement. So that's the difference. Covetousness, I want something like what they have. I want something like what I see on TV. But envy, I want what she has, and I don't want her to have it. So how, is, how are envy and jealousy related? Well, the answer is very closely. <laughs> and we'll see that when we talk about the uh, uh, biblical vocabulary in a few minutes. Both of them are wanting what is directed to or possessed by somebody else. I'm jealous of the love that he is getting. I'm jealous of the possession that he has. I think, again, envy is more narrowly focused. I want to take it away from them. But jealousy is very close. The one thing that has to be said, though, is in at least some cases, jealousy is justified. If a spouse's love is given to someone other than the spouse, then the spouse's jealousy is quite justified. I think we can say envy is never justified. But in some situations, jealousy is justified. And we see it, for instance, in John 2.17. Jesus is jealous for the honor of the temple that is being corrupted. He's jealous that that honor is being taken away because it's a den of thieves. It's become a marketplace. And he's jealous. Now, as you see here, and we'll talk about this more in a few minutes, well, is he jealous or is he zealous? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so, what is the underlying cause of envy? And it's interesting, the, the various sources are all quite unanimous. It is a neurotic sense of inadequacy. A need to build yourself up at the expense of others. Thus, what sometimes seems like arrogance in a person is actually the attempt to overcome this chronic sense of inferiority. Trying to build myself up at the expense of others. And the parade example of that is King Saul. And his pathological envy of David. started when they came back from the battle and all the ladies sang a song. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Whoops! <laughs> now actually, actually, in Hebrew poetry, they're not really building up David that much. In Hebrew poetry, what you do is whatever level the first line is, you jump the number in the next one to the next higher level. So if you're talking about uh, he had four, then he had 40. So it's really, you're just comparing the two, actually. Now you could have had 
David had his thousands and Saul his ten thousands. But Saul sees that and he doesn't think about, well, we're talking poetry here. We're talking numbers here. He thinks, man, they do this now. The kingdom is next. And so again and again you see, and, and the irony here is, here's the biggest guy in Israel. And inside is a little man saying, won't somebody like me please? Samuel picked that up when after Saul had disobeyed God, had not, in fact, dedicated the Amalekites to God, but had saved the king and had let the soldiers bring back the best of the spoil. Samuel comes to him and says, although you are small in your own sight, are you not the king of Israel? He understood. Whereas David, he doesn't have any sense of inadequacy at all. <laughs> he had a maddening sense of adequacy. <laughs> and here's poor Saul eaten up by envy. I want the honor he's getting and I don't want him to get any. There it is. So how central to the human experience is envy? <laughs> well, try Genesis 4. Immediately out of the gate. And what have we got? We've got Cain envying Abel. And again, it's a classic story. As I've said to you before, we have two sons. I understand the Cain and Abel story very well. The older brother has a good idea. Now there's obviously a problem between us and God. So, I'm going to give God a present, and that'll make God feel better about me. So, I'll get my best 30-pound pumpkin here. And baby brother says, oh, wow, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that too. And I'm going to give him my best lamb. And God says, I like the lamb. I'm not very excited about the pumpkin. The baby brother got what the older brother wanted. Now, Cain could have used that experience to think about why does God accept the lamb and not the pumpkin? He could have used it that way. I think the answer is very clear. You don't buy God off with presents. The only way our human problem can be solved is by blood. But he wasn't interested in finding out what God wanted. Envy is not really content to get what the other person has. It basically wants to remove the other person from the contest. So we're talking about a truly dark desire. And the plain truth is, there are a lot more people in the world with an inferiority complex than there are with the superiority complex. <laughs> there are an awful lot of us walking around on earth feeling like we're not really worth very much. We really can't do very much. 
and trying desperately to build ourselves up at the expense of other people. All of us who have been in human organizations have seen that happen. So what are the biblical terms? And you have them there on, uh, I guess, the top of your second page. The Hebrew word is bottom, is it? Okay. The Hebrew word is kana. Q-A-N-A. To show passionate concern or interest. And that can be positive or it can be negative. And so that's where we get the zealous, jealous thing. So the, the biblical text in John 2.17 says, The disciples remembered where the text said, The zeal of thy house has eaten me up. That's kana. Jesus is passionately concerned about the temple. And when they bleed over into each other, as I've said, all jealousy is not negative in the Bible. There is justified jealousy. So zealous, jealous, uh, those overlap. But then it can be also translated envy. And it's, it's interesting to look at the various translations of these uh, references that I've quoted here and see one version may say jealously, another may, may say envy. It's just a, it's sort of a judgment call. What are we talking about here? Just <laughs> passionately interested or, in fact, envious. The Greek word pronounced zelao, uh, both of these letters are O's. This one, though, is pronounced aw, and that one's pronounced O. So that's why I lay it out in that way. Is a virtual duplicate of the Hebrew. It's, it's essentially the very same thing. And so in the English translations, you have zeal, zealous, jealous, jealousy, and of the occurrences, of which there are a lot, as you see it here. Well, no, I've just reproduced here the ones that are generally translated envy. So that one, the Greek one, is like the Hebrew one, somewhat neutral and can be used positively or negatively. The last word, thanos, that's kind of tough to pronounce, P-H-T-H, -H, thanos, is totally negative. Ill will, envy, jealousy at the good fortune of all others. So all of the occurrences, as I've listed them here for you, are negative. This is, this is not neutral. This is bad. So you have in the New Testament about 18 occurrences of words that are translated envy. In the Old Testament, uh, about the same number, about a dozen. I, I've just got it there, 11. Uh, and so for your entertainment, I've listed all the occurrences there. If you uh, are having trouble getting to sleep, you can look those up. So let's look at some selected examples from these. First of all, Genesis 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or I die. <laughs> to which Jacob responded, am I God? 
<laughs> I think that was the first time he figured out he wasn't. Uh, but uh, so yes, here's her <laughs> ugly sister having babies like falling off a log, and she can't have a one. Envy. Envy. Give me, give me what she has and get her out. Gary? Have you ever heard of the song that's in you that makes you want to satisfy the needs? Yeah, yeah, in, in many ways it is, you know, uh, wow, wow. He got summa cum laude. I want that. <laughs> and I've got an 85 IQ. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But nevertheless, we're eaten up with a desire for it and mad that they got it. He's no better than me. So yes, yes, this, this grinding sense of inadequacy and inferiority. Yeah. Thirty-seven, eleven. Now this is my translation because virtually all of the um, translations will say his brothers were jealous of Joseph. Well, I don't think that's true. I think they envied him as we see later when they tried to kill him. They want the honor that he's getting and they want him not to have it. Once again, you know, this is not right. He's the 11th son. Number one son ought to get all the honor, and he's getting it. Or number two ought to get some of it. And dad is giving him this coat. <laughs> and that's one of the ones where, uh, again, there are no literal translations, because nobody knows what kind of a coat it was. <coughs> As children, we all knew it was a coat of many colors. Almost certainly, it's a coat with long, fancy sleeves. But we don't know for sure. <laughs> but something that <laughs> this rotten little brother didn't deserve. And he got it. He got it. His father didn't envy him. He wasn't. The father's the father. He's, he's not in the comparison league that the brothers are in. He just wonders, hmm, what's going on here? What in the world is this thing about <laughs> all of our stars bowing down to his star? Hmm. But that's not where the brothers are. This is... Psalm 106, it's talking about the events that are reported in Numbers 17 and 18. This is Dathan and Korah and Abiram. Once again, come on. Moses and Aaron, they're getting all this honor from God. They've been ordained. Well, we're as good as they are. Probably better. So the psalmist tells it in the camp, they grew envious of Moses and Aaron, who was consecrated to the Lord. Yeah. They're getting this honor, and we're going to have it. And just as well take it away from them. Envy. This is from Proverbs. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Envy will make you sick. Envy will put you to bed. Eaten up by what somebody else is getting that I want, even though 
as, as Gary pointed out. I'm not fit for it, even though I don't deserve it. Even though I couldn't do that, I still want it. As a way of somehow building up my sense of inadequacy, my sense of failure. This one, I think, is very interesting. This is Pilate. Pilate wants to let Jesus off because he knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Isn't that interesting? Oftentimes we'll say, well, they... They, they arrested him because uh, their, their explanation was he's going to get us in trouble with the Romans. He keeps on with this king stuff and we'll all be in trouble. And that's where Caiaphas said better for one man to die for the people than all of us die. But Pilate knows that's not the real reason. They're envious. Now, what do you think about Jesus caused them to be envious? This is a question for you. Why would they envy Jesus? The crowds followed him and loved him. He could perform miracles. <laughs> they often came out looking bad when they had conflicts with him. Yeah. So, you know, wait a minute. These guys are, they're at the top of the heap. I mean, the high priest was the most significant person in the society. And Jesus, who's he? Country preacher with one shiny suit to his name. Riding around in a school bus with 12 thugs. But compared to him, they saw themselves as little, insignificant. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, yes, yes. They, they spent years getting a PhD, and he's got a sixth grade education, and he can talk them down. Yeah. But I just, I just think that's very, en very envious, yeah, very interesting. Uh, Pilate recognizes what's really going on here. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, as, as you're aware, there are several places, and I've just picked out a couple, in Paul where, uh, well, not only in Paul, but in other epistles, where in a list of the things that Jesus has delivered us from, envy takes a prominent place. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let us not become conceited Provoking one another, envying one another. I think that, that trio there is very interesting. Uh, conceited, as I said, all too often people who come across as arrogant are really, really covering up an inferiority complex. Provoking one another, well, why'd you get that and I didn't? and ultimately envy. So in, in a real sense, here's the opposite of what Jesus says about love one another. No. Break apart from one another. Use one another. Judge one another. Provoke one another. puff myself up 
at the cost of others. This is an interesting one. Paul's in jail, probably in Rome. And he says, you know, it's not so bad that I'm here in jail. Jesus is getting preached. <laughs> Some are preaching him because they say, oh, this is our chance. <laughs> Paul's in prison now. Quick, let's have a revival meeting. <laughs> Paul says, I don't care. <laughs> if Jesus gets preached, it's okay with me. Some out of envy and rivalry. Others out of goodwill. Well, Paul's in jail. We better step up to the plate here. But Paul says, I don't care which way it is. If Jesus gets preached, it's okay with me. James. <laughs> I always think of James as a cold shower. <clears throat> If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it for pity's sakes or deny the truth. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Now, part of the reason I chose this one is this combination. Ambition is not necessarily a bad thing, but selfish ambition, building myself up at the cost of somebody else. So he's putting them together. It's also interesting, in several places, envy and strife are paired. So again, it's this fight. Put you down, put me up. Whatever we have to do here. <clears throat> so those are some of the examples from the Bible. So what's the cure? Now in this sense, I disagree with the church. <laughs> uh, you can see what that's worth. <laughs> The church has said for a thousand years, the opposite of envy is patience. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the opposite of patience is contentment. Uh, excuse me, opposite of envy is contentment. And what are we talking about when we talk about contentment? Paul says, and we of course always used to laugh at this, in whatsoever state I am, I find myself content. Indiana? <laughs> mm -hmm. Godliness with contentment is great gain. What are we talking about? And I suggest we're talking about the ability to accept oneself with one's strengths and weaknesses. And this is where Christian faith comes in. And to know oneself loved for oneself. It's also where a good marriage comes in. Okay, so I'm not the greatest guy in the world. But I am loved. Okay, so I can't do everything that anybody else can do, but there are some things I can do. So again, this whole question of self-image enters in. It's not little me inside a big body. It's Popeye the sailor man, I am what I am. 
It is that sense of, yes, it's okay to be me. It's okay that I, well, I won't go into that. Anyway, <laughs> but I think that that's where knowing yourself loved by Jesus, knowing yourself loved by the prince of the universe. Wow. To really get hold of that idea, he thought I was worthy of his death. Oh my goodness. I must be worth something. <laughs> and those of you who work with students know this is extremely difficult in this day when we're dealing with an epidemic of broken homes. I don't know what the statistics are now, but 15 years ago, when children were asked, who was responsible for your parents' divorce? 85% said, I was. Because often the child becomes the center of the squabble. So that helping young persons to come to that place where they can indeed accept themselves as beloved of God, where they don't have to say, oh, won't somebody love me? Won't somebody think I'm okay? That's the challenge that we in the church face, helping these persons to come to that sense of contentment. It's okay for me to be me. Jesus loved me. Now, obviously, you want to encourage them to improve. You want them to be the best that they can be. But it's still, there's the challenge. The challenge of contentment. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And uh, personally, I think the disordered identity is largely coming out of the disordered families. Uh, but, but, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. If I can just be somebody else, I'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, boys wanting to be girls, girls wanting to be boys. <laughs> if I can just be somebody else. And I can remember as a child, yeah, I wanted to be somebody with a, uh, uh, a good, our name Oswald was <sighs> ugly. I, I wanted to have some really elegant last name. And uh, Oswald is okay. Partly because the prettiest girl in the world married one of them. <coughs> This is where the Christian gospel is so important. The good news of the gospel. He loves you as you are. Where you are. Um, I wasn't going to say this, but I guess I will. Uh, envy has been a major problem for me. And I used to beat myself. You call yourself a Christian and you're envious of this and that and that person and this person. What in the world's the matter with you? And slowly, through God, 
I began to sort back through my life. My dad was 45 when I was born, eighth grade education, avid reader, bright man. But um, I was always sure that I was a terrible disappointment to him. I was awkward, never seemed like I did things right. Uh, the, the word that I heard again and again was, what'd you do that for? Now, in fact, I was the apple of his eye, but boy, was he good at covering it up. When I was um, 32 or 33, he was asked to introduce me to a men's Bible study. And when he was under pressure, he stuttered. And I wondered, I wonder if he's going to get through this. He stood up and he said, well, I guess the best thing I can say is what another father said. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Sat down. I had a hard time getting through that. <laughs> but I came to realize that, yeah, there was a little boy in here saying, won't somebody like me? Won't somebody think I did it right? And when I came to the point of being able to say, and I didn't say it to his face, he wouldn't have understood, it would have only hurt him. But when I could say in my soul, Daddy, I forgive you. It's okay for you to be human. I found healing. That's healing in the gospel. That's healing in the good news of Christ. So, forgive me, church. <laughs> I don't think it's patience. I think it's contentment. Contentment. And then something else. Love. Envy is a two-way street. I've got this problem, and I'm hanging it on him and wanting what he wants, wanting what she has. There's the other aspect of the gospel. To love that person. 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not envy. Love, and I've said this to you before, the biblical definition of love is wishing the best for another. I didn't put it here, but you can add it. At whatever cost to yourself. Don't have to envy that person who has achieved this wonderful honor. I can love them. I don't have to want to wipe them out because <laughs> they got what I wanted. I can love them. I can choose the best. I can, Paul, rejoice with those who rejoice. No longer do I have to see them as rivals for limited praise and favor. Again, that's the tragedy of Cain. It's the tragedy of Saul. I'm not getting the praise and the favor that I want. And so I want to take it away from him. No. No. They're not my rival. They're my brother. They're my sister. So look at Romans. Oh, I've got it here, okay. Romans 3 through 5 and 9. 
Remember what Paul has done. He's taken us through the Christian gospel. And now in chapters 12 and 13 and 14 especially, he's telling us what's the conclusion of all this. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, <laughs> that's the conclusion of everything that's brought up to this chapter, up to this point. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. <laughs> That's the other side of contentment. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. And again, knowing yourself loved, you can be honest. Measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Now, you can argue about, is that my faith, the faith God has given me, or is it the faith? I tend to think it's the latter. Measuring yourself by the good news of the gospel. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. <coughs> yeah. I don't have to be her. I don't have to be him. I don't have to wipe her out or wipe him out in order to make myself look better. She's got a function. He's got a function. I've got a function. And it's okay. I don't have to be an I if she's an I. <laughs> I can be a little toe, and it's all right. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Don't just pretend to love others. <laughs> King James says, let love be without hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, NLT's got it right, I think. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. What's the cure for envy? Contentment and love. Contentment as regards ourselves. Love as regards others. As Forrest Gump said, that's all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments, observations? <laughs> well, I might turn that into a sermon. <laughs> it probably was a sermon. You already got it. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 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 Yes, yes, yes. I don't know whether you all heard, in, in politics today, we see this tendency that you have to destroy your enemy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I long for the good old days when the candidate stayed on his front porch. <laughs> of course, there were some others of the candidate's friends who were slinging the mud. But, but yes, yes, it used to be that. Faye. Where, where jealousy is justified, yeah. not, not envy. Yeah. Um, yes? It made me think of the request of Elisha and how pure that was, that he wanted a double portion of what Elijah had. Yeah, yeah. Elisha wanting the double portion, yes, yes. He was, he was eager. He was zealous. <laughs> Anything else?
Pastor who said to young people every day, I want you to look into the mirror and say, I'm a child of the king. And remember that's who you are. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, for me, again, and, and I, I, don't, I don't want you to think badly of my father. He was a, a good man, a, an earnest Christian, and he just wanted his kid to do better. <laughs> But uh, uh, when, I, when I got, Taylor University was a, was a great blessing to me as a, as a young man. Uh, but getting there and, and really hearing the message, you are loved. You are worth the death of the prince of the universe, was really pretty revolutionary for me. Anything else? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us with an unending love. Thank you that you look upon each of us and smile. That you think of each of us as your special favorite. How that works, I don't know. <laughs>